morning everybody. I'm going to talk this morning about Rembrandt's etchings as we come to the end of the year which was the 350th anniversary of Rembrandt's death. In his lifetime Rembrandt was more famous for his etchings than for his paintings and etchings are one of the several processes by which prints are made. Prints um, can, as you know, be multiplied several times from the original because of the way they are made. And I'm going to explain in this talk how some of these processes for printing differ. We'll start with the woodcut printing, which is in the relief technique, and then go on to the intaglio technique, which um, Rembrandt worked in. Intaglio technique comes from the Italian word for incise or cut into and um, I will also mention surface tone which was another technique of Rembrandt's and which he used towards the end of his time doing etchings. We'll begin by looking at a woodcut from the 15th century. In the woodcut technique, it is what is not wanted that is cut away from the wooden block. And then what is left in relief, the picture or the design, is inked for the printing. This one is from the early 15th century. It's German by an anonymous artist, Christ before Herod. In the Italia technique, the original was engraving, and that was where Dura was the great exponent. This example here is Dura's Peasants Dancing of 1514. Uh, Rembrandt didn't do engravings either. And the technique is uh, a contrast to the woodcut. The lines of design are cut into a hard, flat plate, usually metal, but um, it can be stone, it can be glass. And the tool used is a burin. That is a tool where the point is cut at an angle. So the burin groove is V-shaped and the metal cut from the grooves to make the design is then wiped away and the ink goes into the cut lines. This example from Dura is from his fast body of work, Peasants Dancing, um, dated 15. 14. Now, as I said, um, Rembrandt didn't do woodcuts, he didn't do engravings either, but he would sometimes use a burin in his etching work. More about that later. Etching came into Europe from the Arabs, in fact, in the early 15th century. Several artists experimented with it. Uh, Rembrandt's earliest work in etching dates back to about the mid 1620s. And by 1631, he had become the leading exponent in Holland and later in the world. In fact, probably in the history of etching. When he died, he left 290 
etching plates, of which about 70 um, still survive. Etching is also part of the intaglio technique. Um, the metal plate in etching is totally covered in uh, a substance impervious to acid, usually make, uh, wax or a mixture of wax. And the metal plate is usually copper. Now in etching, the lines are cut into the wax ground with an etching needle. It is finer than the burin I talked about for engraving. And after the cutting into the wax with the etching needle, the plate is immersed in acid, which then eats into the metal <coughs> and deepens the lines only made in the wax. They are deepened in the metal by the acid. When the lines are judged deep enough, the plate is removed and the ink is inserted into the lines. Now, that is a very simple etching that I've described, rather like this um, portrait here by Rembrandt, 1630. Um, he did several of these beggar prints whilst he was still in Leiden. And I think John last week showed you one where he'd used his own face on the beggar. Here we have the beggar man and beggar woman conversing. The etching is dated 1630 and it's Picture shows the empathy that Rembrandt had with people fallen on hard times. The work of young Rembrandt shows a strong humanity and that was something he never lost. Now we'll move from this simple etching to the next one, a portrait of Rembrandt's mother in her widow's garb, um, a year after the death of his father in 1630. So Rembrandt's mother at the table, 1631. And you will see that the lines here are very varied from her face, her linen, her hands, the cloth she has across her knee to the much darker lines of her shawl. And this is done by the artist judging that the light lines have been sufficiently achieved in the metal. The plate is then removed from the acid, the lighter lines re-waxed, and then the plate is put back in the metal um, to uh, deepen the lines and therefore produce a darker section of the print. And how long it's left in the, in, in the acid and how strong the acid has to be is down to the experience of the artist. There were certain secrets about his etching that nobody ever knew. Rembrandt took them with him to the grave. In the 1630s, Rembrandt became interested in another technique, the effect, the painterly effect he could achieve with the velvety line of dry point. This is the portrait of Jan Six, and the way that dry point is carried out is that the lines are cut directly into the metal plate with a much stronger, heavier etching needle. And this time, the metal thrown up from the plate, the burr is the name of it, is not wiped away. 
it's left alongside the incised line to also absorb the ink. And the result is a much thicker feathery line. So from the late 1630s, Rembrandt usually used the two techniques, etching and dry point together. And this is what he did in the portrait of Jan Six. He also used a burin in this portrait. Now, um, I'll just tell you briefly uh, the story of Jan Six. He and Rembrandt met in the 1640s and they became good friends. Jan Six came from originally a Hugo French family and their trade was in silk. Jan worked in the family firm, but he was also a playwright and collector of art. And when Rembrandt fell on hard times, he was very good to him. He bought three of his works in 1652, and in 1654, he made a loan of 1,000 guilders interest-free to Rembrandt. And Rembrandt, later that year, 1654, painted his portrait in oils. Now, sadly, soon after that, they fell out. I don't think anybody really knows the reason. Jan Six was a very busy man could get impatient. Rembrandt and the status of the artist had risen during Rembrandt's time. Um, Rembrandt took his time. He took as long as he needed when he was doing a portrait. And he did have a history of being difficult with uh, clients during his successful period. Um, he demanded payment for the portrait before he'd even started work. And if a client was to dispute the likeness, he didn't even consider it. He said he would leave the question to his guild. Um, so, Rembrandt didn't have a very good history with his clients, which didn't do him usually much good in the hard times. Whether this happened with Jan Six, we don't know. But suddenly, when he got married to Margareta Tulp, the daughter of Dr. Tulp, you remember Rembrandt did a portrait of Tulp dissecting a body, he didn't invite Rembrandt to paint her portrait. He asked uh, Rembrandt's pupil, Flink, to do so. Um, so uh, the beautiful portrait of uh, Jan Six in etching, showing various ways of working by Rembrandt. Now, these combined techniques are also seen in Rembrandt's largest and most striking etched landscape, The Three Trees of 1643. Um, this combines uh, dry point etched lines of varied lengths and also some engraving and this very strange sky depicting the wind blowing across Amsterdam, which is in the background. Um, that was the way Rembrandt began with his landscapes, painting first of all the background, then moving forward as he put more detail into the foreground. In this landscape, we have a lot of detail. Um, you can see the artist perhaps up on the hill. Um, yeah, there we are, the artist up on the hill. 
the people, two people here, a couple fishing in the river, and possibly you can see there in among the undergrowth, a couple having an intimate moment. So lots of detail in the foreground. Some people think that the three trees um, are alluding to the three crosses, which in fact he painted in 1653. I don't know whether there is any ground for that or not, but um, certainly religion was um, an important part of Rembrandt's work and the genre were often doubled up in his work. So here we have an apparently poor family traveling across this nighttime landscape. Um, in fact, the story is the flight to Egypt crossing a brook, 1654, and it is from the New Testament story of uh, Mary and Joseph with their baby Jesus following the advice of the angel and returning to Nazareth from Bethlehem um, via Egypt to escape the massacre of, um, by King Herod of the innocent. And uh, this one, I think I said, is uh, again etching and dry point 1654. Um, religion, as I said, was central to Rembrandt's work. And this one shows um, the drama that Rembrandt was capable of in his work. The angel is making the annunciation of the birth of Christ to the shepherds. The angel is on a cloud surrounded by a crowd of cherubim here and on the ground the terrified shepherds and their animals are uh, escaping from the scene in all directions. Now this drama that Rembrandt was capable of has a story to it. The Amsterdam had long been used to traveling theater groups coming through the city with liturgical or uh, secular plays. And in 1637, the theater in Amsterdam was opened for the first time, first theater in Amsterdam. Rembrandt enjoyed going there and the drama had an influence on his work. So uh, another one in Etching and Tri Point, uh, 1634, this one. Now, the many depictions of the religious background had Catholic uh, elements in them. This was not acceptable in the Protestant churches. By this time, Protestantism was the official religion of the seven provinces of the Dutch Republic. But that Republic was very open-minded and tolerant of other people's religions. So here, we have the Virgin Mary on her bed, very ill, being looked after by a carer. And above her, all the angels are there looking over her and wishing her well. Um, and there was another element at that time in Rembrandt's life that might have had an effect on this etching. And it was 1639 when Saskia first became ill 
with the tuberculosis which caused her death. Another religious print is called the Hundred Gilda print, an allusion to the high price that was apparently once paid for a copy. <clears throat> it was produced in 1649 and the official title was in fact Christ Healing the Sick. There are in it several uh, stories, elements from St. Matthew's Gospel in the New Testament, chapter 19. Um, elements from the chapter which happened at different times. Here we have this young man, a rich young man, absolutely devastated because he has been told that it was easier for the camel to get through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. And the camel, we move from the light to the shade, and here we find the camel referred to. Back again into the light, this young mother is bringing her baby to be blessed by Jesus, and he is holding back a protesting disciple there, saying, suffer the little children to come on to me. So let this mother through with her baby. We also have the blind man being led forward to, for Jesus to cure his blindness. These are very poor people. Somebody has arrived in a wheelbarrow. This woman here has been dragged in on a carpet. We can still see the dirt under her feet. And it is, uh, we have the uh, officials of the Jewish uh, church here, the synagogue, uh, discussing among themselves what's going on. And it is wonderful the way we move from the dark to the light in this print. And then in 1650, Rembrandt produced Eke Homo, Behold the Man, in Dry Point entirely. Um, this is the story where Pontius Pilate presents uh, Jesus to the crowd watching below and offers them the choice of choosing who can escape from the punishment of crucifixion, Christ or Barabbas the thief. And um, the uh, crowd chose um, Barabbas to go free. Now this dry point is this searching is in its fifth state. What happened was when the artist changed the plate uh, so that the print would be quite different from previous prints, it was said to be in a new state. And this one is in the sixth state. The people have been removed and two tomb-like entrances relating to what is going to happen have been, um, are being shown here. Um, the reason that Rembrandt had removed the people was a purely practical one. The burr on the etching print had worn down. Um, from an etching plate, you could usually get easily a hundred prints. But with the burr, far fewer, only about 15, 17, something like that. So the burr had worn down 
and he decided to remove it altogether for practical reasons, but in fact, it gave him a distinct artistic advantage because it has removed not just the ones who decided Jesus should be crucified, but anybody who would have stood up to him, for him in that scene. Um, and another technique that Rembrandt developed as in his paintings, Rembrandt worked with a great inventiveness in his etchings, using techniques that had never been seen before. And here we have um, what is called surface tone. The excess ink, some of it is left on the plate, it's not wiped off altogether. And the effect is to give deeper shadows and therefore more atmosphere to the print. Um, this is St. Francis praying beneath a tree, dated 1657. And you'll see there in the shadows is what can only be a ghost or a memory of Christ on the crops. Um, so another technique that Rembrandt invented. So all these etching dry point plates then had to be printed. And here we have um, an etching printing press. The um, etching is by uh, a Frenchman, Abraham Boss, 1642, and it shows three men working on the etching plate. The one in the back there is with um, a leather-like um, pad pushing the ink into the grooves. The one here at the front is with his hand wiping away the excess ink. And this one is operating the printing press. It is a roller printing press. And what happened was the etching plate was put on the press face upwards and the paper, a damp paper, placed over it. That way it would better um, soak in the ink. And so when the printing had been done, the damp papers were hung up on a clothesline to dry. Now, um, in fact, that allowed, if the artist wanted it, a counterproof to be made. The, uh, the damp print was put down face upwards and the print would now be the opposite way around from the etching plate. Um, but then another piece of paper was put on top of it and both were put through the press again. And we have the first print the other way around and the counterproof exactly like the etching plate. And artists, would use that sometimes to decide what needed changing in the etching plate. Um, something else worth mentioning is about the different papers that Rembrandt used. Um, he particularly liked the Eastern papers, um, particularly the Japanese paper, which gave the print a warm yellowish color it had a fine, smooth surface. Um, so that was a great favorite of Rembrandt's to print on, but he also used vellum sometimes. Um, so 
by all those means, Rembrandt produced, um, left a legacy of etchings. That is the end of the talk, but um, you may like to have an overview of what etching consisted of. The metal plate, usually copper, was coated with wax. The etching needle draws the design by cutting into the wax and the metal underneath the wax is then exposed, the lines in the metal. The plate is then placed into the acid bath. The lines become etched into the metal by the acid and the artist decides how long it stays there, how often it's done, the strength of the acid. The overview of dry point, another intaglio technique developed after the 1630s, the lines or grooves are cut directly into the metal. The metal is thrown up on either side of the groove and the burr, what's thrown up, is left in place and also inked. The lines on the print are now darker and more feathery compared to etched lines and obviously no acid is used in the dry point stage. So thank you for being a very nice audience. I will show you my bibliography. Thank you. Mostly from exhibitions of um, Rembrandt's etchings, but um, I will say that this book by Anthony Griffiths, Prints and Printmaking, is a very useful text and you can buy it in the British Museum. Okay, thank you.